Hey people, how are you doing? Welcome um, to the Sports Therapy Association video, video cast and podcast and also going out live this month once again to One Chat Live podcast and the One Chat Live Facebook page. How are you doing? Um, my name is Matt Phillips. I'm the host of the show and as always it's recorded live on Tuesdays at eight o'clock, currently GMT plus one. Um, so if you do want to join us live for the recording and be able to ask the guests questions um, and also kind of mix with the other people who come and join us live, then um, all you've got to do is head to either the Sports Therapy Association YouTube channel um, or this month. Again, if you want to, if you prefer listening on Facebook, particularly if you're a runner, then go along to the Run Chat Live Facebook page. There we go. How are you? Hope you're well. Um, I'm back with my feet on British soil once again after last week um, going live from Finland, which all went well. Thankfully, the Internet connection was OK. And um, before I forget, if you make if you've got your diary open now next week, there isn't um, an episode it is five weeks in, in the month. So we're taking a week off um, next week, but we will be back the week afterwards. So if you've got your diaries open. Please don't start flocking in next week because you'll just be looking at an empty screen. But anyway, if you are listening to the podcast, that's great as well. I appreciate not everyone can join us live, especially if you're one of our international listeners. But if you'd be so kind as to leave a review um, and a rating, particularly on Apple Podcasts, that'd be great. It just helps um, the good word of our special guests get out to more people because we appear higher in Google searches. So um, you've joined us for the month of May. We're starting a new topic and that topic is going to be nutrition. Before I do, let's not forget about last month's topic, which is still getting some great emails um, and some feedback. It was all about sleep last month in April. Um, and we concluded um, last Tuesday, like I say, live from Finland um, with Dr. Amy Bender, who is the director of clinical sleep science at Cerebra. And she, as well as talking about in-home polysomnography, which is an in-home system of um, measuring not just the kind of typical stuff which your wrist wearing kind of wearables measure but also the eeg so the actual different stages of sleep um using um electrodes which i went through for five weeks which shows we looked at the results last week and uh, that was very interesting i had some interesting questions what are you going to do and are you, are you drinking coffee now and all these sort of things which i'm happy to apply to it's fine um and also other questions coming through so if you want to watch that then uh, you, if you want to watch the video i do recommend you do watch the video because there was lots of slides which we brought up sent to us by the fantastic team at Cerebra um, with details of what they measured over the course of five weeks, showing really nicely the effect of me giving up caffeine after a week, the effect it had on my ability to go to sleep, the sleep latency, uh, the number of times I woke up in the night. It showed the effect of removing caffeine on my performance and coordination the next day. Um, lots of different stuff. Also showed that I definitely do. Um, I am sleep deprived and I need to take steps to do that. But I knew that already. But caffeine's a big one. Um, so, yeah, that's all there. If you want to listen to the audio, then just go along to your favorite podcast app and uh, subscribe to the Sports Therapy Association uh, podcast. And you will find it there to listen in your own listening time, which is fine. Um, so that was last month. This month, it's all about nutrition. Um, I'm just checking now. I'm just hoping that people are able to get in. I haven't seen anyone come in to join us for the live thing yet, which is slightly strange. Um, I think I'm going out OK, but once people do come in, I'm going to just check my phone um, to make sure I'm not getting any massive kind of what's going on. Matt, we can't join you. No, it's OK. I think people start coming in soon, hopefully. Um, so, yeah, it's about nutrition this month. Um, people ask me about nutrition way, way back, and I kind of put it off for one reason or another. Um, but this month, I'm very excited. We've got some excellent speakers coming along. And tonight is absolutely no exception. It's a guest um, who first joined me back in August, nearly a year ago. Um, uh, in episode 64 of the Sports Therapy Association podcast, um, Dr. Gary Mendoza, who's a behavioral change or behavior change expert, university lecturer and personal trainer. Um, and back last year in August was talking about motivational interviewing for client communication. It was the episode of the year for me. Um, and that's kind of big talk because we had some amazing guests. But for me personally, I took so much away from that because it just made me suddenly think if you don't know how the person how ready the person in front of you is to take your advice whether they're just going to go home and brush it off whether it's going in one ear and out the other then what use is you opening your mouth what use is that so it was really interesting i would encourage you to all go back and have a listen to that um, and have a look um 
uh, at Gary's website and have a look at some of the courses he's put together. Uh, but tonight will be a great chance for you to get to know all about that as well um, under the realm of nutrition. Um, as always, if you are joining us live and you want to ask questions, and that's great, you can do that. And I'll bring your question up on the screen. It gives you a chance to flash your little uh, Facebook or YouTube logo as well. So it's good for networking. Um, and yeah, you're welcome to do that if you want to. If you listen to the podcast, and you've got questions. Obviously, you can't ask us directly, but you feel free to put stuff in the comments, which I check regularly. And I can either forward that to our guest or try and answer myself, depending on what the question is about. So without further ado, what I'm going to do is bring up... Uh, Dr. Gary Mendoza. Hey, Gary, how you doing? Hi, Matt. Thanks for inviting us on. That's OK. Um, I'm slightly concerned because, like I said, normally there's kind of people flocking in now. So I'm not sure if there's some kind of YouTube thing going on, but that's fine. We'll have a chat. We'll go through it. Yeah. Um, where are you anyway? I've forgotten. Where are you talking from now? I'm in sunny South Wales and it actually is sunny for once. <laughs> South Wales. That's interesting because normally when I, uh, I don't want to kind of fall out with anybody in Wales, but normally when I've guessed in Wales, there's kind of a few internet problems and it's not that crispy clear, but maybe, <laughs> maybe that's just Mike James. I'm not sure. It could just be Mike James because you are coming through loud and clear. So um, thanks for coming along. It's no been problem. a year since we last spoke. Does it feel like a year to you? Uh, that's quite <laughs> when you said that earlier, I thought, yeah, long, surely <laughs> i had the same life, thing yeah my life gone <laughs> i know it's 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 worrying isn't it especially when you get to our age it's like well that was a nice year great let's yeah. let's do the next one try and slow things down a bit um so yeah we're talking about nutrition tonight to give people an idea of um your background which i think is really interesting i think um it'll be inspirational for quite a few people then yeah give us a little breakdown of your background how you got into nutrition and how this crossover happened between nutrition and behavior change yeah sure uh, so i've been a personal trainer 30 odd years now before that was in the forces uh, working as a personal trainer in the field and also managing um leisure clubs um, things like that, gyms, city centre gyms and what have you. And the one thing that it kind of slowly dawned on me was that I don't know very much about nutrition. I felt like I was forever blagging it. Kind of, I read something and think, oh, I'll tell my clients that, that sounds good. And it got to a point where I thought, well, I've got to do something about this. So I thought, no, I'll, I'll go and train properly. So I, I went and did a degree in applied human nutrition. Um, got a first class honours degree. Uh, and then came out, worked as a PT for a bit more using the skills that I'd learned. So combining the nutrition with the personal training. Um, and then I kind of got headhunted basically by Future Fit Training. And so ended up writing all their nutrition courses. And whilst I was working for them and training personal trainers in nutrition, it kind of dawned on me that what we were teaching the personal trainers was actually working. They were going out, they were working with their clients teaching them sound nutritional principles and people were losing weight and the trainers were like well this is amazing because it's like it's no, there's no magic here we're teaching just sound nutrition so i said to the company it would most probably be worth researching what was going on because then we could kind of back up any claims about nutrition and weight management so they sponsored me to do my phd which is a multi-dimensional model for the treatment of male obesity in a community setting is the long-winded title <laughs> And, and so basically what I did was I trained personal trainers in nutrition, but the other area I was interested in was behavior change. And so I kind of combined that as well because we had the activity side, obviously being personal trainers. We then had the nutrition side because I was teaching them the basics of that. But the other thing that was interesting was, are people psychologically ready to, to actually make these changes? And so big part of my PhD was, uh, the psychology of behavior change and in particular psychometric testing and what was fascinating about that work was i discovered that people would take on a personal trainer even though they weren't psychologically ready to change and what i found was from the data from the psychometric tests, i could predict who would lose weight and who wouldn't and so off the back of that i then did a second study and i told trainers right you can only take clients on if they are at this level of psychological readiness. And when we did that, we got an 86% success rate. So suddenly the success rate had gone through the roof simply because we were screening to see if people were psychologically ready to change. 
That's brilliant. Okay, I'm going to stop you there because there's there's something there which is so amazing. That sentence you said where people will sign up for um, personal training, for some kind of goal, even if they fail the psychometric test, which shows that they're not ready to change. So mm-hmm. why? how do you think that happens to start off? Why do people sign up if they don't even realize that they're not going to listen to the person they're working with and paying? I, th- I think this is true, whether we're talking about trainers, whether we're talking about therapists, whether we're talking about physios, because I think people go along to a professional, possibly with a skewed idea that, well, the professional will have all the answers. And so all I have to do is do as I'm told, which is a nice theory. But we know that that really is not the case. I mean, I always remember I tore the tendon off my thumb. Um, and then had physio to rehab it. And I was in a group of about five or six, some of them a bit older or whatever, but I was a rugby player. So I was driven to get fit again. I was motivated. And the physio said to me, she said, a lot of these, I will give them the exercises, but I know that between seeing them now and seeing them next week, they won't have done them. And so there was your group that were coming along to a professional, but psychologically weren't actually ready to rehabilitate or whatever. And so I think that's really important because if your time as a therapist, as a trainer, as a nutritionist dietitian is going to be useful, then you've got to be sure that the client you're working with is kind of in the right, for want of a better word, the right headspace. Because if they're not, you are really wasting your time and and you're wasting their time as well. So, yeah, I think it's quite important to understand where a client is psychologically. That's so interesting as well to think that they don't themselves even know they haven't stopped to think, am I in the right headspace at the moment to do what they're going to tell me to do? It's cool because we know, I think research has showed that one of the biggest barriers to recovery can be lack of adherence to doing like the exercises you're given. And and we kind of try and improve that by by avoiding giving too many exercises by kind of asking the client what potential barriers they've got to doing these and all that sort of stuff but it sounds like from your research that you've showed another fact which might explain that lack of adherence in that they're just not got the psychological or the headspace as you said to actually take on board what they what they want and what they need to do yeah and the, the beauty is you can actually get them to a point where they are ready. And this is really where I discovered motivational interviewing. Because when I, I lectured in New Zealand for two years at Massey University in sport and exercise nutrition. And so I repeated my research there with the Maori and South Pacific Islanders. We got exactly the same results, this 86% success rate when we screened. And so the Manawatu region of North Island said, we want to adopt this right across the health board. But one of the problems we had, because it was going to be public health, there was an ethical thing about, well, you can't screen someone psychometrically and then just say to them, sorry, you're not psychologically ready. You can't join the program. You had to have a solution for that. And so the solution is motivational interviewing because motivational interviewing is designed to take somebody that's ambivalent about a particular change and help them move psychologically to a point where they are ready to change. And so we train trainers in motivational interviewing as well, which basically meant they could then screen. And if the person was psychologically ready, great, we crack on. But if they weren't, well, let's spend some time working with them to get them to a point where they are kind of good to go, as it were okay so that's interesting so i guess yes you reached a point in your research where you had this dilemma of okay so what we should do then is do these series of psychometric tests and only offer our services to people who pass them are ready to change and maybe just say to the others look i'm afraid you're not ready yet go away and sort your lives out and but one that's not a good business model i suppose ethically it's not great either because um, ethically it wasn't good but i mean to be frank i didn't know what the answer was in fact what i suggested to trainers was Give your clients information on nutrition, weight management, whatever. Let them go away and read it, take it on board. And then in a month's time, retest them and see if there's anything's changed. Mm. But as you rightly say, ethically, you're technically refusing treatment, which, you, you know, public health can't do. So we had to come up with a solution. How did you just and what do you mean what the time frame was like between thinking what do I do here this sounds a bit dodgy telling them no I'm so I'm not going to work with you and then coming across this motivation interview 
six months going through the psychological literature uh-huh. and there are lots of kind of ideas around behavior change but motivational interviewing seemed to be the nearest to what in terms of the ability to be able to train a trainer in it without them needing a degree in psychology or whatever and mm. and the other thing about motivational interviewing which is sometimes misunderstood it's really just a better way of communicating so from a training perspective it was like well i'm going to give you a new skill regardless no matter how much on top of it this will improve your communication and if that's all we do we've made you a better coach trainer physio whatever so yeah and how did you manage to kind of stumble in on getting taught by the actual creators of the system how did that happen that was that was pure good fortune because towards the end of my time as i came back and was based uh in near cardiff i then thought right i've got to get some training in this now now i understand what it is looked around and there was a course literally when i was looking three weeks after when i started looking a course in cardiff which is like under the hour for me to drive to Mm -hmm. and it was being taught of all people by stephen rolnick and bill miller the Mm -hmm. two guys who had initially come up with it so that was just pure good fortune so i did the basic course with them there was then an intermediate course six weeks later and i i said to stephen you know am i gonna have enough skills to do this he said well as long as you go out and practice for six weeks yeah so i did the intermediate i then did the advance and i was fortunate when i did the advance that i did it with uh bill miller and this time terry moyers and terry moyers the professor of psychology and she's the leading researcher in motivational interviewing in the world Mm. pretty much so it's like every step of the way i just had the best people to teach me and i've remained friends with him ever since so i was very very fortunate fantastic you must have done something very very nice in the previous life then if everything fell into place (laughs) for you that's cool Um, found out how uh, were they interested to hear where you were coming from when you kind of explained the research you'd done and and how what you're hoping to get out of it yeah they loved the fact that it was evidence-based and you could tie it in with weight management and what have you because obviously that's a big area now in the uk especially the obesity statistics are horrendous Mm -hmm. and and so I, i kind of proposed this system to the welsh government but they weren't interested so they they pay lip service to oh yeah we need a better we need an obesity czar and blah blah and it's like well i've got a system here that works that's mm. been adopted by public health and they went mm, not at the moment <laughs> so yeah that must be really problem that must be a big problem for a lot of people like yourself who like it's, you say it's frustrating because yeah. you know i i could train practice nurses in doing this which would take off the pressure off of gps and every gp surgery could have a system that at least is evidence-based and has got a pretty good success record but so let's go into that let's see you've mentioned like the the problem with obesity which seems as far as i know unless i'm not reading the right kind of information is not getting any better if anything it's getting slowly worse and worse um does that suggest that the strategies that are being put in place at the moment or historically are not working or is it just more and more people now are falling prey to something that's causing them to get obese well we've got an obesogenic environment so basically everything around us is pretty much designed to make us fatter and despite what the food industry will say the problem is partly them because they're trying to sell you product so that's their business model the government again i think they pay lip service and one of the problems the government's got in fairness is if you look at all the research for obesity nutrition and everything most successful programs require kind of one to one or maybe one to two or one to three and so in my research we had groups the biggest group was uh, four individuals because we found that men will not work in big groups they prefer smaller groups the problem with that is you then can't turn that over to the dietetic service and go right all the obese people in your community you need to work one-to-one with that they just couldn't do it i mean it would they'd be swamped and they're already swamped anyway with other clinical nutrition issues and so i think we need to kind of find another solution and i think trainers therapists are all well placed actually to give 
at least, I mean, I think if we were just giving sound advice around nutrition and exercise, it would be a, a move in the right direction. And if we're then able to couple that with some information about how to make a behavior change, well, then we're kind of quitting because we're kind of ticking all the boxes. We're talking about activity exercise. We're talking about better nutritional choices. And we're talking about how you might go about actually making them as well, as opposed to here's the healthy plate model. Everybody should follow this because most people are like, I, I don't know how I would do that. So it, it's an education process, definitely. I'm glad you brought that up, actually, because if you probably some people will take pride and go, yeah, I study nu uh, nutrition and dietetics and stuff. And it's all about the healthy plate model. And that's as bad as far as their education will go. And they presume that if you get those percentages correct and you encourage your client to show them ways to do this and that, that everything will be OK. What are, the, what are the limitations of that model? Or I think it's, it's it is a fundamental misunderstanding. So if you talk about carbohydrates, if I go and ask the general public, what is a carbohydrate? You will generally get a response of pasta, bread, rice, things like that. They almost discount the fact that fruit and veg will fall into that category as well. It's like they kind of see that as separate. So that's a problem in itself. Mm -hmm. There's a misconception that certain carbohydrates are fattening. And that's most probably because of the way the media and especially social media portray it any food will be fattening if you've got too much of it i mean it, it's basically at a really really simplified level and i know some people will shout at the screen at this point it's energy in energy out it's about energy balance there are a lot of factors that factor in around that but that when it, when we boil it right down is is where the starting point is before we look at everything else and so if you've got excess of anything whether it be carbohydrate protein or fat ultimately excess calories means your body will save them as store them as fat because it's the only way it can there does seem to be a yeah i often admire not admire it's the wrong word i just sit back and watch these debates about it's just basic maths what goes in what goes out what are some of the factors that cause the controversy over that kind of taking it down to that level right well there's definitely a genetic predisposition Mm -hmm. So some people undoubtedly have got, for want of a better word, poor genetics. So mm -hmm. they're maybe more predisposed to storing body fat. Maybe they're not as efficient at metabolizing fat. I mean, it, there's lots of factors there in itself. And we mm -hmm. don't understand the genetics. That's the problem. We understand elements of it. But I could show you some diagrams of like hormones, enzymes and everything else. And they are so complex that to just look at a diagram that is that, I mean, if you, if you can imagine, most people will have seen the London underground map. Mm -hmm. If you imagine all the lines on that, multiply that by at least a hundred and map it all together. That's how complex obesity is in terms of enzymes, hormones and everything else. So when people start to then try and isolate one hormone and go, Oh, it's all about that. So a few years ago, everybody was talking about, leptin and ghrelin which are the two major hunger hormones but if you look at everything that sits around those two alone it is so complicated if it was as simple as oh we'll reduce leptin or we'll increase this or whatever we'd had a pill for it mm -hmm. decades ago and the very fact that we haven't been able to come up with a kind of pharmacological kind of remedy for want of better speak tells you just how complex it is so genetics are huge we are slowly starting to understand the gut brain access and we now hear you hear that term a lot now the gut brain because we now accept that hormones enzymes within the gut signal with the brain and the two work together in terms of appetite and how that's controlled and so what's happening in your gut biome is actually very important in terms of how you will regulate your intake. And then people will then talk about, oh, well, it's your gut bacteria that's poor. You've got poor balance in there and what have you. Well, if I tell you there's over a trillion bacteria in there, do you want to tell me which one it is that's poor then? And so that, again, it's like, well, that's more complex than maybe I thought. So there's that aspect. We've then got the environmental aspect. 
you know, we're, we live in this obesogenic environment where we're getting these adverts thrown in our face thousands of, you know, every second on TV, billboards, buses, social media. So we see that all the time. And then we've got cultural differences. And so, and that's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of some of the things that you kind of almost have to take into account when you're looking at helping somebody improve their diet and maybe help them reduce their body fat. I'm not a big fan of talking about overweight, even simply because I think it kind of misses the point. I do think we should talk about over fat because I, I think we need to reframe our language. People say, oh, I'm overweight. It's like, well, no, actually, you're not overweight. You're, you're over fat. You've got too much body fat because I think people become so reliant on the scales. Scales are great when they go in the right direction, but the minute they go the wrong direction by a pound or so, it's like, oh, it's all gone wrong. It's a catastrophe. And now we're back into the psychology of it. It's like catastrophizing is a recognized condition in cognitive behavioral therapy. And so the way we even look at failure and the way we deal with it is actually important. And from a trainer's perspective, understanding that how their client is going to deal with it is like, that's a minefield in itself. So it's complicated, to say the least. That's great. I haven't heard that yet. I'm not quite sure. I'm going to have to use that as a soundbite, by the way, but I'll get your permission first. Dr. Gary Mendoza wants to start calling it over fat. I think there's a little community of kind of like people at the moment who would probably cancel you for that. I'm not sure if you're bothered or not. But, yeah, it's interesting you say that, um, over fat instead of overweight. The only thing that comes into my mind is that kind of suggests that fat is the enemy when it comes to choosing your foods. But as far as I can see, that can be a little bit of a an oh, error as well, isn't it? Completely misleading. <laughs> you need, I mean, I'll give you a, a prime example because I work with elite athletes. So I'm a sports dietitian qualified with Sports Dietitians Australia before anyone goes, well, what qualifications for that? I am qualified. But if I work with elite athletes, we know that if we drop the percentage of fat below 20% of the total calories, it has a negative effect on performance. So you can technically have too little fat in your diet. And so we shouldn't vilify fat mm -hmm. because essential fats in particular, especially if we're talking about injuries and recovery, well, essential fats are crucial because of their anti-inflammatory role. Mm -hmm. So they become really important in terms of what does your diet look like if you are trying to recover. When I work with elite sports people, I talk about recovery diets and what have you because it's just so important. So, yeah, we shouldn't it, – it, I, I say over fat simply because I just think it's a better description. Mm. Because you're trying to get rid of body fat. It's a bit – I'll often have clients come to me and they'll go, all right, what I need to do is I need to lose about half a stone because I've got a wedding in six weeks or whatever. And I'm, I'll be like, okay, which limb should we chop off then? And then, oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like that. That. <laughs> it's like, well, you just can't reduce your fat that quick, you yeah, know, yeah. pound or two pound a week, possibly, depending again how over fat you are in the first place. But often I'll say to somebody, well, do you know what? I, I can't help you with that. But what I could do is get you into a dress size smaller. Is that any good to you? And they're like, mm. oh, God, yeah, where do I, you know, where do I sign up? Yeah, yeah. I, when people are over, obese, overweight, I'll often say to them, what was it that made you decide to do something about this? Now, very often, not always, but very often, the trigger is my clothes don't fit. I put a pair of trousers on, I couldn't quite do them up. Or I tried a dress on, it was too tight. So what, whatever that might be. And so then I'll say to them, okay, well, I, you know, if we do something about that, then we can kind of get you back into that. I said, but what, I, what baffles me is that type of approach. So your clothes being tight was what told you you needed to do something. But now you're going to use scales as your way of measuring progress. I, I always use the analogy. That's the equivalent of hearing a noise in your engine in the car getting out and looking in the boot for the problem. I said, one thing indicated, and now you're going to look somewhere else for the, for the resolution. I said, so let's stick with that close size. And if you can get back into them, then we most probably have achieved what you want to achieve. 
Brilliant. Great advice there. Well, look, it's already half past and we haven't even started on motivational interviewing really yet. But yeah, there's some absolute gems there and I should have expected um, none less from some of your experience. People have now made it in. Just a little break here. We will come back to that. A um, load of people have suddenly tumbled into the room. Um, I think for some reason what's happening is it's not going live on YouTube for some reason. Um, so what I suggest, if you do want to join us live and ask some questions in the second half hour about motivation interviewing in particular, and uh, depending where the conversation takes us, then try going over to One Chat Live on Facebook. Um, we must be going out somewhere. So maybe try <laughs> that. Apologies if you're on YouTube. I'm not quite sure what you're seeing then. Maybe it's just a the video hasn't started. But anyway, if you want to try joining us live, I've seen a lot of people coming in here, like Glenn Murphy and Phil Griffiths and Becky's here um, and Catherine. So, yeah, tr see if uh, join us on Facebook. Catherine has now joined us. So it's working on Facebook. There we go. I'm pleased now. There we go. Um, Catherine. Gary, you can take a take a breather. That wasn't you. OK, um, it was obviously some technical thing going on. I'm sure you didn't doubt yourself for a second. So, yeah, if you want to join in people and share some questions um, and see what's going on the screen then come over to Uncheck Live on Facebook. Apologies. I don't know what's going on with YouTube. Obviously, I haven't worked. Um, but anyway, right. So um, so we've talked a lot about, well, we've actually dipped into some of the key areas where myths and misconceptions um, and the whole kind of calorie in, calorie out debate and seeing fat as the enemy. Again, I seem to remember, and I don't know, it might have been, I don't think I challenged it. I think I just glorified it because it just confirmation bias. But I think there was a graph which showed the, increase in obesity alongside the increase of the introduction of fat low fat foods in supermarkets yeah. i think it, although it's tricky because there's other factors you can twist a graph as you want but it kind of showed to me quite clearly that when the supermarkets decided what else can we put on our shelves we need a whole nother selection let's make low fat stuff and people suddenly started thinking right this is how i'm going to uh, lose weight now just have low fat stuff and at the same time it showed very cleverly another line of whoop obesity just went up because it's a total kind of miss uh, portrayal of what the cause was um, yeah i mean there was there was a definite correlation between the two and mm -hmm. because i think the way it was marketed was oh if it's low fat you can eat as much of it as you want mm. and what was happening with most low fat and still to this day most low fat foods can actually or not always but they will often be more calories than the original product and the reason for that is when you add fat to a food to a meal it what it's what food technologists call mouthfeel it's that creamy texture in your mouth it fat gives it that flavor so if you've ever tried a normal digestive biscuit and a low fat digestive biscuit, the low fat digestive biscuit will taste quite kind of dry and powdery. And that's because it hasn't got the fat there to give it the mouthfeel. And so if we're going to remove fat, we have to be able to replace it with something. Otherwise, the product will just taste terrible and people won't buy it. And generally what you t tend to see is they replace it with sugar. Sugar and salt are the classic two ingredients they will use to try and get some taste back there. And so consequently, you end, especially if they are using sugar, you end up with a product that's got more calories than the original product. And mm. so that becomes an issue in itself. And you get a classic, yeah. With vegetarian, vegan and gluten, because now people think, oh, gluten free or it's vegetarians. Oh, well, I'll go vegetarian. I'll lose weight. That there is no evidence that that is the case it's just it's another type of diet and quite often what happens if you suddenly if you've always been a carnivore all your life and you decide to go vegetarian great you can be perfectly healthy as a vegetarian but the problem is when people switch over to that they may be a bit limited in what they can kind of prepare food meals and so on and so what actually happens is when they turn vegetarian they produce a calorie deficit because they start eating less and very often they cut out all their takeaways and what have you. And so consequently, all you've actually done is you've created the calorie deficit almost by accident. Interesting. Yeah. Right. We're going to have to, I mean, it's great that we're talking about this because I can imagine myself as a younger therapist kind of, splurging this all out to my client impressing them with this information and stuff which is true 
and telling them about, well, did you know that low fat diets and this and that, and don't do this and don't do that. But this kind of brings us on to the um, kind of clutch of tonight's discussion is you can try saying everything you want, but if the person listening to you isn't actually listening and they're not in the right state of mind to take it on board and they might not even know it. Those of you just joined us, by the way, just to let you know, it's really Dr. Gary Mendoza was saying earlier on that, psychometric testing he did on his during his doctorship showed that people will sign up for like a weight management program even though they don't even realize they're not in the right frame of mind to actually do what's necessary they fail a psychometric test which shows their headspace and readiness so it's um that's basically what we're going to talk about now in the uh, next kind of 20 minutes so motivational interviewing um how are you going to break that down in 20 minutes, Gary? Not an easy task, but where do you start then? Is it a case of, is it subtle or do you hand over a psychometric test and say, do this for me and I'm going to work out whether you're, what stage you are and how able you are to listen and how I've got to talk to you? I think I think it is subtle, but it, it's basically, it sounds like something you do on someone, but actually when when you hear it described properly, motivational interviewing is just a different way of working with your client and it's all about active listening and so becoming a better listener and then making sure that when you hear certain phrases keywords whatever from a client that you reflect those back so as they start to hear their own language about change and so it's more about your listening skills and also what you choose to give back to the client it's also kind of going back to what you were saying, actually, about, oh, I've got all this knowledge I want to tell everybody. In motivational interviewing terms, we call that your writing reflex. In other words, someone says, oh, I'm going to do keto because I've read that's the best diet going. And straight away, you're like, no, no, you don't want to do keto because if you become ketogenic, it increases in acidosis and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. So you like say you, you mind dump, you brain dump on them in terms of all the information. That's your writing reflex. And we've all got that. And so one of the key things that people learn when they learn motivational interviewing is you've got to tame that. You really have got to be uh, Bill Miller loves sayings. And um, William Miller, Professor William Miller, is one of the founders of motivational interviewing. One of his favorite sayings is people don't like to be should on. You should do this. You shouldn't mm. do that. You oughtn't do that. And so that's something we need to learn straight away as trainers, coaches, therapists, whatever. So if you've got a client on the table and you're saying, well, what you should be doing is da, 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 da. at that point when they've heard should, they're not in the room with you anymore. They've Their brain's gone somewhere else. And so you now spout off five minutes of really useful information, actually, but they're not taking it on board at all. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want people to go away with the idea you can't give information. You certainly can and you certainly should. But there's a right way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it. And so it's like, choose the one that you want to do, because if you don't choose the right way of doing it, you might as well have saved your breath. It's very good. That's That's very good. Catherine now. Catherine is on fire now. Um, and Catherine says Eight, that she's uh, watched. Yeah. I think it's a bigger number than that. <sighs> I'll read it out for people listening to the podcast. So Catherine Reimer said, I remember in one of your web uh, webinars on nutrition, I'll show you a screenshot. There's so many free webinars out there from um, Dr. Mendoza that it's well worth looking into on the website. Um, yeah, you said there's over 80,000 diets listed on Amazon. If diets worked, why are there so many? Also, they are kind of working off the same system of using a deficit by cutting out certain foods, food groups, rather than educating people to have a better mental attitude around food, rather than giving certain foods a negative connotation and telling people this food is bad. Yeah, so valid point. Yes, Gary? Yeah, definitely. The good and bad food thing is a classic example of how psychology works. If I was to say to somebody, right, you've got to cut out chocolate, chocolate's bad for you. The only way you can make sense of that sentence is you will have to get a visual representation of chocolate in your head. So if I if do it now, think this of like, okay, chocolate's bad, I can't have it. Straight away, you'll get a visual image of chocolate because your brain has to make sense and it, it can't take no, don't, can't. So it just takes the chocolate bit and goes, oh, that's what it looks like. What you'll now find is 
when you go into a garage on the forecourt or into a supermarket or a shop, you will spot chocolate everywhere. It's like somebody is deliberately trying to trip you up in terms of Ooh, is chocolate temptation in the way. What's happened is the chocolate has been put onto what we call your RAS, your reticular activating system. And so this is the way your brain copes with the environment you live in. Because if you had to take on board every piece of information that your eyes are seeing, if you just look in the room you're sitting in now, if you had to be able to process the colour, the size of the chair, the cushioning, the pictures on the wall, the book titles, everything, you would be frazzled. And so what the RAS does, it, it's kind of like your important list, if you want to think of it that way. It says, like, these things are important, so please highlight these to me when I see them. Everything else, filter it out. Mm -hmm. And so by calling something good or bad, we put it onto that important list. And so now suddenly people are having to cope with it. And so it's the wrong way of going about it. If we were going to do anything, we're most probably better off talking about these are the foods you should be eating because at least it will highlight them whenever they see them. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, don't, don't kind of vilify any food because I can show you diets that are perfectly fine long term that have got pizza and Mars bar and what have you. It's, it's all about kind of relative how much of that is in the diet. Great comment, Catherine. Thanks for that. Um, more pearls of wisdom in that. Um, yeah, amazing. So I just want to, because you mentioned that, I just want to bring up in the stream here, I'll put it on full screen so people can see um, where this information is. There's loads of great free videos and long videos. It's kind of, you think oh, I'm going to click on there and get kind of eight minutes. Um, but actually there's long, long presentations um, on the website, Stages of Change. So stages, as it sounds, of change.co.uk. Um, and if you go in there, there's information about Gary on the front page. I love that photo. Um, and then you'll see video blog index page um, and loads of webinars on their motivating behavior change. Uh, the April webinar using contingency contracting behavior change webinar. And then you scroll and it just keeps on going. So we're always talking on 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 the show about free CPD and the idea of getting to know someone um, and what they're about before signing up to a course it's so important you know um, and it's a great way of seeing whether that particular cbd is going to help you which we've talked about a lot as well not all cpd will suit everybody at the same time so take advantage of that go to stagesofchange.co.uk and there's so much information on there to see how um dr gary mendoza and his stuff could help you um so thanks for reminding me about to put that up there Catherine. very kind of you um we got another question coming in. People are starting to find us now. Apologies, people. Gary's found us. Um, the Gary just walks in like there was no problem at all. Evening, a bit late to the party. Apologies. Gary had no problem finding us. So I don't know how he does it. Maybe because he's like six foot plus and just sees over everyone. Gary presumably had no problems finding us. Everyone else had problems finding us. Oh, Gary yeah. says it's on One Chat Live Facebook page. Okay, so I don't have to YouTube tonight. Apologies again. Um, so yeah motivation interviewing so yeah it's it's i love the way you say that it's not to be regarded solely as doing something clever to somebody it's more learning how to communicate listen properly um you've already kind of mentioned some of the gems what are some of the other things which people maybe have the eureka moments at which they're introduced to when they do your courses on on behavioral change and that what's some other kind of gems i i think one of the big things is people people often don't realize how much of an impact the way they communicate impacts on another person. So I'll give you an example. We had one particular trainer complete the workshop and he was saying to me, I've got this particular client. I give her all the information. I've been working with her for six months, but she's really awkward. She doesn't do after stuff and blah, blah. He then finished the workshop he, on the Monday, had this, this client again, but now he's going to use, motivational interview and do everything consistent with mi so bill miller talks about just being mi so rather than thinking of it oh it's a technique it's more of a way of being with people and so anyway he did that and he he texts me back and he said well this is amazing she's she's doing it all and she's totally changed and she said and and now she's following and listening to what i'm saying and I said to him, I said, that was she was never an awkward client. The problem was you and the way you were communicating with her. And I said, and now you're kind of, rather than 
Because I think often as professionals, and we're all kind of guilty of this, thinking, oh, I'm just that little bit better than you. I know that little bit more than you. What we want to be working when we're working with a client is we want to be level pegging. And so when we don't want a directing style, which is the way we're classically taught. Oh, what you should do is this. What you should do is that. What I'm suggesting you do is this, blah, blah. That's directing. That's going my way or the highway. What we want in MI is a guiding style. So we're kind of alongside our client and we're helping them navigate this journey. Now, from time to time, they're going to take a wrong turn. So this is where we use our expertise and we offer information. Hopefully they then accept that information and then they, and that brings them back on track. And so it's just we're working alongside. But the thing I always try to stress when I work with clients is ultimately, if you're going to get results, it's going to be down to what you do. There is nothing I can do or say that will help you in terms of making the change. Ultimately, you have got to make the change. All I can do is give you some tools, but you need to decide which of those tools you're going to use. And I think if they accept that from the outset, we're kind of starting from a good place because they've, kind of, they've equally, when things don't go so well, I point out to them that, well, that hasn't worked because you haven't followed the advice I've given. It's, it's not my fault. And so there's a clear boundary in terms of I can help you, but you've got to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes even just setting that out right at the start of a treatment, a consultation, whatever, it kind of puts the client at ease to some degree, but mm -hmm. it also makes it very clear that, look, I'm not going to try and just impart information and, and hopefully you'll take it on board because I know that won't happen. So it, the way to give information, the way you work with the client, the way you view the client is really important. And they will pick up on that. I said about Terry Moyers, she's one of the leading researchers in, in motivational interviewing. And she's done a lot of work around empathy. And what she's discovered is if we look at a consultant's success rate, and she deals a lot in addictive behaviors, so alcoholism, smoking, things like this, drug abuse. And what she's found is it's not the experience of the counselor and it's not the level of education of the counselor. The biggest single predictor of a successful outcome for the client is the counsellor's empathy. And so over and above everything else, if you haven't got empathy and you haven't built empathy with the client, then your chances of success are slowly sliding off the hill. Mm -hmm. And empathy is a really important thing because in the advanced behaviour change, which I look at how you're going to combine motivational interviewing with cognitive behavioural therapy, I look at how you can build empathy with a client because there are certain things you can do that will be, you'll become more empathic to the client. And so they kind of do feel that you are there to support them and nurture them on their journey, whether that be recovery, whether that be weight loss, whatever it might be. I was thinking as you were saying this, this is so applicable to not just nutrition. It could be applicable to some kind of rehab program or some kind of coaching of some form or sticking to the exercise. It's it's brilliant. And it's so evidence informed. It's so on the same page as working with the client, being a facilitator, not an operator anymore. You're not lying them down, doing things to them. You might do some of that, maybe, but it's being at their side physically and mentally. It's, it's beautiful. It's brilliant. You're ticking my confirmation boxes wonderfully. I remember why I waited, rated you so much now last year. I was thinking, how is it that Gary made me stand up there in front of all those people and say, this is my favorite podcast of the year so far? Um, no, it's amazing. Really, really, really healthy, good stuff. Um, I so, go with the empathy thing briefly. Hmm. I just talked about giving information there. When you give information, as long as you do it in, you respect the client's autonomy their right to choose. So I might say to a client, they might say something, I don't know, let's, let's stay with the keto diet again. Oh, I'm going to do keto. The way I would approach that is rather than, oh no, you don't want to do keto. I, I would say to them, I've got some concerns about keto and I've seen problems with other clients. Would you be interested in hearing what they are? Now they're perfectly entitled to go, not interested, don't tell me. Nine times out of 10, they will always want to know. But now I've respected their autonomy. Mm -hmm. And we know that when a client's autonomy is respected, 
that builds empathy as well. Mm. So it all starts to tie together in terms of that lit feeds into it, this feeds into it. And so that's why I think it's so powerful. Yeah, brilliant. And it reminds me now, I mean, I think we've said this a few times as well, as we are moving from operators doing things to people, breaking down scar tissue, speeding up um, circulation, all these things we used to think we could do to people. As we're moving now to facilitators and educators, that's where the CPD needs to go. And unfortunately, in the industry, and you look at our kind of chats all over social media, there's a distinct lack of that still. Most of the CPD out there is a new technique to do to somebody. Give it an acronym. Do this new method of stretching, new method of this, new method of blah, 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 blah. A new fascial train, a new some kind of – it's all doing things to people and changing their biomechanics. So that's why I so much love this kind of stuff you're doing because I always kind of take it back to – um uh, no pain mike damn i always get his name mixed up with um mike james mike stewart of no pain.co.uk he was one of the kind of guys he used to start off his kind of like lectures with how many of you are therapists and have done a therapy qualification everyone in the room puts their hand up and then he goes right um how keep your hand up if you've done an education certificate of some form and like everyone's kind of puts the hand down because no one has so we're kind of trying to be educators now, but we haven't done any CPD of how to be an educator, how to communicate, listen, use our ears and all that. So sits in very nicely. Right. Becky has got a question there. And Becky Cowell, I can guarantee, is going to be a great question. Um, so let's bring it up on the screen. I'll read it out for people listening to the podcast. Forgive me if this is off topic. Becky, you're always forgiven. Every time you open your mouth, I'm happy to bring it up. All this has been mentioned. Do you have any advice on how to support a client who has suffered with anorexia and has bad associations with dieting? I think that's a really good question. And, I, and I do think we've got to start thinking about scope of practice because I, I get this a lot with personal trainers. They same situation, all my clients, anorexic or whatever. What do I do? And my answer is always the same. Refer them to a dietitian. Dietitians train for three, nearly four years and then they will specialize into eating disorders. And so somebody that's got those type of problems, you just haven't got the right level of quality. You can certainly support them. And what I would suggest is get a referral to an eating disorders dietitian and work with the dietitian because the dietitian will give them very specific advice around what their diet looks like. But you can support them in terms of educating them about healthy eating sound nutritional practices so i think it and i'm a massive fan of if it's not your area of expertise then refer out because there's there's no loss of face with that and you'll get it back in spades because if you refer out to somebody the next time they're looking for a therapist or a physio or whatever they'll go oh well there was that person that referred to me I'll refer back. And I think if you've got a strong referral network, far better to become an expert in your field, have an understanding of what other fields are, such as nutrition, behavior change, certainly. But ultimately, I think you that you've got because you can do more harm than good if you think, oh, I know what I'll do, because you're kind of tinkering with things. So mm -hmm. yeah, that would nice. actually be my approach and in my own experience as well i'm sure you've had this as well becky it's important what you say gary there is so true for other reasons stay as part of that chain because if you've built up a great working relationship with that person who's coming to you then they might not want to go and see someone else they might not feel so happy for whatever it is so you've got to stay there and recommend them to someone who you sing their praises someone you know about and some of the information you give to that dietitian who might not have the same skills, it might not have as much empathy as you. They might not do exercise like you do. So it's really important. I've had people before who um, have been suffering with anorexia and they come to me because they know I'm a runner and then I'm active and they and they haven't had good experiences working with dietitians because they said, you shouldn't be doing running so much or you shouldn't be doing that yoga. You shouldn't be trying to do um, Ashtanga. Do something like some Hatha yoga. Slow it down. And they're, they think they're doing giving great education information, but they're not realizing that the person in front of them bases their identity on being able to do really strong mm -hmm. yoga. And so yeah. use your skills, work with them, have a little chat with the dietitian and realize that they're only human as well, just because they're an expert at a different Becky, place. Becky says she's already working with a specialist, which is great. 
ask Becky in that case, ask her why she thinks certain foods are bad. Where's she getting that information from? Get her to kind of explain to you why she thinks they're bad and then maybe correct that if you can. Um, but if you're not sure, then go away and check. I, I always say this to people. If you're not sure, just say to the client, do you know what? I'm not 100 percent sure about that, but I will find out an answer for you. And I'll do that quite regularly. And people often say, I'll oh, but you're a doctor in nutrition and blah, blah. And I'm like, sorry, but I'm not the font of all knowledge. And I'd much rather go and get you the correct information and give you that than maybe try and blag it a bit and and set, set us on the wrong course completely. So I think if she says to you, oh, certain foods are bad and I've read this, I would then check with somebody. I mean, check with me if you want, but find out where that idea is coming from and then maybe help correct her and give her some information that is factually correct. So, Mike, you were talking about runners there. So if you are working with athletes, one of the best places you can go and look is Sports Dietitians Australia's website. There's lots of PDFs on there, diets for runners, netball players, you name it, they've got it there. And the other one is the Australian Institute for Sport. There's a ton of information on nutrition there in terms of not only sound nutrition, but sports nutrition as well. So they're two really good sources where there's lots of free PDFs and downloads. Fantastic. Becky, you have got recorded now that um, Dr. Gary Mendoza said, ask me if you want. So there you go. Gary's going to be busy looking at his email. For the, you know you've done there, Gary. <laughs> now, that'd be great. Don't mind. Sounds like it'd be a really uh, useful, productive uh, conversation. Be keen to, yeah, it'd be interesting what language she is using, where she's got those ideas from. Very cool. Nice question, as always, Becky. We like that. Um, we're coming towards the end of the hour. I'm sorry if you joined us late on behalf of YouTube. I don't know what happened there. I do what I can every week, people, to make sure that it goes out cleanly. It's just technology. I've no idea. It's a shame. It's, anyway, so um, I'm interested then now for the last uh, few minutes just to break down what you do offer on your site. Just going to bring it up on screen again now, if that's all right. Um, part of the free stuff, obviously, we have got courses there. Oh, See, this is why I need my crib sheet. The behavior change booklet. Excellent yep. bit of information. Tell us a little bit about what people can find on that. It's a free download, isn't it? Yeah, basically, it's a free download. Um, you have to give me your email address. There's always quid pro quo with these things. But it will give you uh, 10 pointers for anyone wanting to change any type of behavior, whether we're talking nutrition, exercise, whatever it might be. It could even be for your business in terms of procrastination. And these are 10 pointers and pretty much I've designed it in such a way that you can print it off, pin it on your fridge and go, all right, you have done that. I haven't done that or whatever. And so if you've got these 10 pointers in place, your chance of making that change will be improved at least. And so it's a good kind of starting point when you're thinking about whether it be you making a change or your client making a change, get them to work through those 10 points and see if they've got them in place because it will certainly aid their behavior change attempt. So, yep, that's downloadable on, on the homepage of the website. And with the right client, that could be suitable language for your client as well as you kind of checking things out yourself. It'd be yep. something you could offer to the client. Really cool. Okay, and then um, courses. I mean, there's so much, obviously, you offer and stuff which we've talked about today. Let me just put this on full screen so I can people can see it properly. So the Applied Nutrition and Supplementation course obviously is specific to what we're talking about today. Yeah. Do 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 your courses always include a little bit of the motivational interviewing or is that something they do on the no, side? The, the Applied Nutrition and Supplementation was a course that was AFN certified a few years ago. And then we, I kind of I stopped teaching it because I moved more and more into behavior change. But I've then realized that actually a lot of people need even just sound nutrition information. So I've kind of started reteaching that. And, and in, later in the summer, that will become an e-learning course that you can kind of do self-paced. But it's very comprehensive. It's got a manual that's got over 700 references in. So it, it's, it's, it's everything you'll need to know about basic nutrition. And then if you go along the kind of top line there, you've got the introduction to behavior change which is a very short e-learning course. It will give you a couple of tools you can use for yourself, you can use on clients. It's about three, three and a half hours, four hours worth of different lessons, all e-learning, self-paced. 
The Behaviour Change in MI is a taught workshop over Zoom. Um, do that over three or four weekends, depending on which one you're on. And then the Advanced Behaviour Change is a fairly new course where I then take the skills you learn with motivational interviewing and look at how you can use some techniques from cognitive behavioural therapy to enhance the way you help a client through achieving a behaviour change. Fantastic. Loads of stuff on there. So, yeah, just to reiterate, people, um, yeah, if you missed the beginning, then all of this is available um, at stagesofchange.co.uk. Lovely laid out website. Simple, um, honest advice going on. URL is above my head here. There you go. <laughs> of course, it's there above his head as well. Um, Catherine Reimer has said, I could do with this just using myself. What was that? The 10, the list of 10 behavior things, Catherine? Yeah. That's the thing, isn't it? All these things for you can, as a therapist, it's wonderful. We can learn about it ourselves and often apply it to ourselves and then kind of tweak it according to the individual who we've got in front of us. I think that happened with the, with the um, sleep month as well. Great. Well, look, um, it's 9.02. Um, Gary, thank you so much for once again. It's twice no this problem. year coming a habit um of uh of joining us really appreciate it um such great information um i, I, I really want to listen to that to myself you dropped some really great bits of advice um and analogies and things which people, people can use with their clients um and it's and people who you get joining up your course personal trainers therapists is it quite therapists, a broad spectrum nutritionists dietitians yeah. because motivational interviewing it's a skill you can use in all fields. It's it's becoming very big in coaching, funnily enough, in elite coaching. So there's a very good podcast that Stephen Rolnick does. And they have, they have the Scottish Sevens coach on, the English basketball coach, Watford FC's manager. They are all using motivational interviewing as part of their coaching there. Mm. So it's becoming more and more prevalent in elite sport. And the other area is in education. A lot of teachers are now using it. And I Without certainly doubt. incorporate it into my lectures now. Yeah, it's always been the gem of teaching courses that I've done is kind of limit teacher talking time and encourage student talking time and put your hand over your mouth when you're listening to somebody just so you just remind yourself. I think it was you who said to me, actually, when someone, pretty sure it was you, if it wasn't, I'm going to credit it to you. When a client is talking and they stop for a while, leave that silence. Yeah, don't silent. jump in straight away. What did it's you call silent. that? It's golden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was it. Yeah. And I've used that. I've used that yeah. with my with my um kind of learners and with clients because it's a lovely pause where you almost get you're giving permission for that person to continue rather than yeah. thinking, oh my god, it's gone quiet. I need to say something. I'm in control of this conversation. Really effective. You should try that, people. If you're listening, next time you're talking to a client and it kind of goes quiet, that's not your cue to start dumping. What did you say? Brain dumping again. Yeah. Um, that's a cue just to look at them, smile, and just nod and then they'll come out with some more you know it's great i love because that what, what happened in the first part of that conversation is they've kind of got rid of the conscious thought mm. and if you leave that pause one or two seconds it will seem like a lifetime to them they will then have to access their subconscious and often again another bill miller saying that's where the good stuff is mm. so getting that subconscious thought out is actually quite important so cool really good Love this guy. Love this guy. Brilliant. Right, Gary, um, hang around so I can say thank you to you just for a couple of minutes. I want to sign people out this lounge, if, if that would be, if that's okay with you. Oh, thank yeah. you, people, for joining us. Um, I'm, again, apologies for if you did join us live. There was a, I don't know what happened. I'll find out now. Uh, but I'm glad that you found us, the regulars found us eventually. Um, you would have missed it at the beginning, but just to reiterate, there's not um, a Sports Therapy Association podcast episode being recorded next Tuesday. We're getting a break. Um, there are five Tuesdays in this month. So next week, we're just having a break. But we are coming back the week after. So we're talking about May the 17th, where we're going to have the one and only Matt Fitzgerald, um, who I'm so excited. Anyone who knows me knows I love Matt Fitzgerald to, to bits. Um, uh, internationally acclaimed nutritionist, um, ath endurance athlete extraordinaire, um, um, and a great writer. If you're a runner and you're listening on the One Chat Live podcast, then hopefully you know about Matt Fitzgerald. If you don't, then just get any book he's written whether it's brain training for runners or diet cults um his more recent books life is a marathon um they're all amazing so inspirational for runners um but for anybody who's interested he's gonna be talking about nutrition for endurance athletes which is his kind of gem 
Um, and also be interesting to catch up because those of you who have been following Matt on social media will realize that the past year or more, he's been suffering from long term COVID. So it will be interesting having a little brief chat about that as well. Um, so, yeah, that'll be in two weeks time on May the 17th with Matt Fitzgerald here. But um, as for tonight, once again, thank you to you, Dr. Gary Mendoza. Really appreciate your time. Thanks, and um, thanks for joining us live, people. We will see you in a couple of weeks if you want to join us live on May the 17th. Take care of each other. <laughs>